This is the Curriculum and Evaluation Committee. It is Monday, May 20th, 2019. We are in the Nashua North Boardroom and it is 536-ish. Okay, welcome. All right, so we are starting off with our favorite Oh, take a ten. Did I, what, did I do something wrong? No, did you say May? 19th? May oh, May 20th. I'm sorry if I said that wrong. Okay, roll call. Yeah, we all need a little help from our friends. Okay, all right, Mrs. Porter, that's me, I'm here. Mrs. Timmons? Huh? Ms. Hohensi? Here. Um, Mrs. Oden? Here. And here. we have Mr. Kaufman. And we have Dr. McKinney. Um, Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Okay, and our, and our guests. All right, ready to begin. Okay, so we're starting with our student spotlight, and this is how we begin all of our curriculum meetings by focusing on the wonderful things that are happening in our schools and with our amazing students. So I'm going to turn this over to um, Gail Casey from 21st Century to start by introducing um, our guests. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gail Casey, and I oversee the 21st Century Programs for the district. To my left, I have Casey Appleberg, and she is the site coordinator for our program at Dr. Chris, and she has brought one of her students, Sheridan, who attends the um, 21st Century Program and has for a few years. Um, the reason why we were asked to present today is not only to highlight the work that the students are doing after school, but also to share with um, the district and stakeholders that we've just received a grant to extend 21st century programs into two more elementary schools. Um, that won't take place until the fall. There's more information to be had there. But for today, we asked for Sheridan to share with you all what she likes about after school and why she is excited for other students in different schools to have the same opportunity. You ready? My name is Sheridan, and I go to Dr. Chris. And I wanted to share with you. And I wanted to share with you my favorite 21st century program is Cooking Matters because we try new food and play games. We also get to do Crazy Eights Math Club, which is a class where we play games and do activities using math in creative ways. 21st century is important for students in Nashua because it gives the students a safe place to stay after school. We get to do unique activities like planting, field trips, Girl Scouts, and STEM buds. I am so glad that the students in Sunset Heights and Birch Hill Elementary School will have 21st century program too because they can have a chance to do the things we do. They get to have a healthy snack, Girl Scouts, Youth Advisory Board, Cooking Matters, and Crazy Eights. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sheridan. That was excellent. What grade are you in, Sheridan? Third. Third grade, good for you. That was excellent. Um, does anybody have a question or comment for Sheridan? Mrs. Oden? What's the favorite, what's the most favorite thing that you've cooked? Um, black bean brownies. Oh, mm -hmm. how so. interesting. Oh, good for you. Were they good? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Kaufman. Hi, thank you for sharing your information with us. But I do have a question about the extension of the program. You said you received an, an additional grant for two other schools. Are both those Sunset, I forget, out of the 12 schools, so Sunset Heights and Birch Hill, are they both Title I? They are not Title I. Uh, Title I funds are required. Uh, in order to be a Title I school, you have to be at 40% free and reduced lunch. Okay. In order to be uh, eligible for a Title IV program, like what 21st Century is, you have to be at 30% free and reduced lunch. Um, so both of those schools are eligible for the program. Terrific. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see these kinds of programs are finding their way to other schools and not just to the Title I programs. Thank you. Okay. Um, anybody else? 
No? Um, Sheridan, thank you very much. You represent your 21st century and your school program very well. Good for you. And I hope, are you, are you going to be going in the summer school? I think the 21st century. You and your mom will decide. And thank you, mom, for bringing her here today. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Precious. Okay. All right. Um, part of the work of um, this committee is to evaluate new curriculum, and I'm um, excited to present today the science, re or new materials, I should say. Um, so there has been a um, science committee going on, and we have uh, Lisa Janicek here, and she is the middle school science coach. And um, I did attend the full day um, committee meeting where these materials were, re were reviewed and I can uh, attest to what a robust and thorough process this has been. And we're really excited to hear the recommendation of the committee. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Mrs. Porter. I believe a packet was sent out to you, and you all should have um, a packet that starts with Curriculum and Evaluation Committee and has a picture very similar to the one that's up there. Um, it includes some multiple pages that we can talk about as this presentation um, goes on. There was also an addendum piece that was actually the rubric. Mm -hmm that was sent out after, so I'm hoping everybody has a copy of what the rubric looks like that we actually took these resources through. There is one piece that I'm afraid didn't get into the packet. The last time I was here, I passed out the little bookmarks mm -hmm. that listed the three dimensions, and I thought, well, I'm guessing people aren't gonna bring their bookmarks, because I didn't say bring your bookmarks. Mm -hmm. um, so I do have sheets here that do the same thing that those bookmarks do. So thank you, Dr. McKinney. So I will be going into depth into the process that we took to evaluate the resources that we had the opportunity to pilot over the past two years. But I thought it might be a nice idea if I just gave a broad overview of what a science classroom would look like. I know that I did a brief synopsis of this the last time I was here, but just to refresh everyone's memory. When we talk about our new state standards, we're talking about three-dimensional learning. And you can see up on the left-hand side there where it says practices, core ideas, and then cross-cutting. Those are the three dimensions. Now, when we talk of standards, the first thing you think of would be the content. That's the orange piece, the core ideas. That's your life science standards, your earth science standards, physical science standards, and your engineering standards. The cross-cutting concepts, and if you can look on this page, and I did do it in color just because having it color-coded does make it that much easier for you to discern the three dimensions. The cross-cutting concepts are in green. They're at the bottom of the page that is green and orange. Those are your overarching science ideas. So it doesn't matter which domain you're teaching, life science, earth science, or physical science, these are those big picture ideas. Patterns, cause and effect, which is really big with our physics classes or the physical science classes. Scale, proportion, and quantity systems, um, energy and matter, structure and function, stability and change. These are things that teachers have done for years, even before these standards came out. The standards just neatly put them in a package, and it's the lens through which students look at the content. The last piece are the science and engineering practices, and these are the most important. They're the behaviors that scientists and engineers use to answer their questions and solve their problems. And the idea of a science class is to have students 
act and think like scientists. So the students actually engage in the science and engineering practices, and it helps them build a deeper understanding of the content, which are the DCIs, and the cross-cutting concepts, and we refer to those as the CCCs. So instead of just learning facts that are very isolated, students are actually figuring out science, and they get a deeper understanding of that as opposed to memorizing something for a test, coming in, regurgitating it, and then not remembering it or being able to apply it to a different situation. And this sheet actually does a nice job of summarizing those eight practices. So the way a lesson would be planned out is that the entire lesson is based on a phenomenon. And that seems like a big scary word maybe. Um, a couple of rules about phenomenon. One of them is they don't have to be phenomenal. <laughs> what they are is they're an observation or an experience that the students either see or have, or it could be an engineering problem that they want to find a solution to. The key is that they will learn and understand scientific principles to help explain that phenomenon or solve that engineering problem. And this is how they would go about it. After that phenomenon has been introduced, it could be something as simple as why do the leaves in the fall lose their green color? Mm -hmm. That would be a phenomenon. They can learn scientific principles that will help them explain that. And hopefully they could use those same scientific principles to explain a similar phenomenon or a totally different phenomenon. They do it using that blue box area that you will see. The students are going to engage in the science and engineering practices. They're going to collect evidence. And they don't do it just once. They'll have a series of investigations that help them understand specific scientific principles, and in the process, they build in an increasing complex explanation for that phenomenon. The great thing about it is, it's just not a matter of giving them a test at the end. Gee, can you explain this phenomenon? You actually assess them by having them apply those scientific principles to a different problem. These are some examples of some phenomena. So in the past, we've always taught by topics. We're going to do motion. We're going to talk about the, you know, we're going to learn the water cycle. We're going to learn photosynthesis, phase change, natural selection, or light energy and matter. So we were teaching specific topics that were isolated. A phenomenon needs to be very specific. In these cases, storms in Galeton have become more severe. In the process, they're going to learn about the water cycle. But it isn't just reading about the water cycle, memorizing it, drawing a poster, and passing it in anymore. They're going to be able to take that understanding and explain why storms in a certain area are becoming more severe. The same idea with a lake on Titan. That's actually rather new. When the probe went by in 2015, there was a lake on Titan. Went by in 2017, it wasn't there anymore. That's actually um, one of the lessons that's in the resource that we will be recommending. It just shows how current that resource is. And the same with the others. You can see, instead of natural selection, Kids trying to figure out why a rough-skinned newt population has become more poisonous is far more interesting than, OK, guys, today we're going to learn about natural selection. Another focus that we've done in the classroom over the last two years is having students be able to make a claim, support it with evidence, and then tie that evidence 
back to the claim with reasoning. You think that it might be a rather simple process to do, but what we see is that we scaffold it for our students and they increasingly become better at doing that as the year goes by. So if you walk into a science classroom, you very well might see that poster hanging up. And we always like to see students. These are students in a seventh grade classroom. What they're doing is they were given the phenomenon that bones are hard and the first thing they did is they are modeling, so they're trying to draw out what's in their head. Why do they think it's hard? So you're gonna start from where the students are and hopefully over the course of many lessons, you move them towards being able to answer that phenomenon. Now in this lesson, they went through cells, cell structure, osmosis and diffusion, cell membrane, all those topics that we always did, but it was far more engaging for the students to be able to try to figure something like this out. So that would be science in a science classroom. I thought that I would give you a quick overview. The middle school has been piloting science resources over the past two school years. And over those two years, we've piloted six resources. We narrowed the field this past year to three resources. Teachers at all grade levels piloted one or more resources during that time. It was totally their choice. We had ongoing feedback through our PLCs, our weekly discussions that we would have with grade level teachers. And this spring, we had the rubric, which you all have in your packet, and that was adapted from a national science resource rubric, and I have the acronym PEEC there. Um, I believe that stands for Primary Evaluation of Essential Criteria of the Science Standards. And then after that, we had the rubric tuned by our science steering committee. So in your packet, you can see that rubric that we used. And this is a timeline. Two years ago, last spring, the district adopted the New Hampshire science standards and we began our first pilot in September. By the end of that year, we realized that the resources that we had didn't quite fit what we were looking for, and we felt like we needed another year, and I'm very happy we did that. We began our second pilot in September of 2018. The rubric was adapted. It was reviewed by our science steering committee. It was brought back to the science steering committee for a final viewing. We had our resource review, which happened on May 7th, and I'll go over the committee that was involved in that. And then we have tonight. The resource committee was focused on three very important pieces. They wanted a resource that would accurately portray the content, the science and engineering practices, and our cross-cutting concepts. They wanted something that could support teachers in the pedagogy of the state standards. It is calling for a shift in the way that we've taught science in the past, and we needed something for the teachers that they could refer to. And most importantly, we wanted something that was gonna support our students in deepening their understanding of the scientific principles by being engaged in the science and engineering practices. So I mentioned the shifts in practice. This is, I believe, the first page in your packet. There are eight of them. I'm hoping that you had the opportunity to review them. Um, I will say that we polled our middle school teachers and a good number of our high school teachers, and they were on a continuum, and everybody sort of placed themselves either in the middle or moving towards the right-hand side, so everybody is headed in the direction that we're hoping that they will be in.
This is the expertise that actually made up our review committee. We made sure that all three middle schools were represented. We had a high school science teacher. We had an elementary science teacher. I was present as a facilitator. We had teachers that had experience with ELL, math, special education. We had a literacy teacher. We had our technology coach. The district administration was present. We had middle school administration representation. And we also had um, two Board of Ed members. And we were lucky enough to have a parent that was from Fairgrounds. Certainly an eclectic group, but it was a great conversation. Um, and s I am so happy that we had those teachers that were in the middle. Um, they just brought a different view and their knowledge and what they brought to the table was absolutely amazing. These are the results of our review. If you look on your rubric, you'll notice that it is broken into five innovations and those are along the top in that pink color. You could get a score of zero to two. Zero meaning that it did not incorporate the innovation. One meaning that it partially incorporated it and two that it did incorporate the innovation. Our recommendation is for the district to purchase Amplify Science as the common resource at the middle school level. It was unanimous of everyone that was on the committee. The second runner-up was iQuest, which is from Activate Learning. You can see that the scores were definitely lower than Amplify's on the rubric. Amplify Science is a literacy-based science program. It was funded by the National Science Foundation. It is research-based. They are connected with the University of Berkeley Hall of Science, and they sort of oversee everything that has to do with the resource now. So I wanted to summarize just a few of the comments. You have in your packet a list of comments from our pilot teachers, and you have a list of comments from the committee that reviewed the resources themselves. But I wanted to make note that Amplify was nationally reviewed, and the results are there in your packet. Our review committee confirmed those results. They do have accurate content standards, science and engineering practices, and CCCs, and that was not the case with everything that we reviewed that day. It does support teachers as they deepen their understanding of the standards. It is phenomena-based. One of the best parts about this is that there were intuitive supports that would help teachers in shifting their practice. And there were intuitive supports on what would come next or suggestions on what could come next. Um, new teachers and seasoned teachers can use this resource. One of our pilot teachers, she's been teaching for 20 years and she, you know, we were having a conversation about it and she said, you know, once I get going, my persona, my teaching style was coming through, even though she was using the resource pretty much to the T. It's nice that everything is accessible online. And what's even better is that all the resources can be downloaded for offline use. And that was something that was very, very important to have for the teachers because, you know, internet can be sparse at times, but if you have everything there, then you're able to carry on with your classes no matter what's happening. There was the question of professional development as well. Our middle school, um, they 
laid the groundwork by giving our middle school teachers NGSX training. That stands for Next Generation Science Exemplar Training. It helps them with that storyline format of beginning with a phenomena and taking them through a series of investigations and tying it all together. Amplify also will be including five days of professional development. Part of that is on how to use the resource as well as implementing the standards. They also have webinars that are available on demand. The last one that I had watched was um, how to meet the needs of your ELL students. And the first part of the webinar had to do with specifically that and then how you can do that using the Amplify resource. And there's real-time teacher support online. When you bring this up, and this is amazing because I had a teacher, she forgot how to unlock the assessment and she had a group of students in her classroom. And so she goes, I don't remember. So she typed it in. She said, I have kids in front of me. I don't remember. Within two minutes, they came back and gave her this, the steps to be able to unlock that assessment so she could have it with her kids. So certainly there's room for questions, but I also have some examples, some print copies of this. So I'll hand them to you, Mrs. Porter, and you can decide. There's a life, an earth, and a physical, and there's also program information in there. Okay, so this. Once the committee has a chance to ask some questions, I have a couple of things. Okay, all right. Um, so I think it's always important at a pilot, we did this for the English language arts too, to bring the actual samples here so that uh, board members can see what the materials look like um, during the. Uh, the meeting, the, the uh, steering committee meeting, mm -hmm. or no, it wasn't the selection committee. The selection committee. Every <laughs> committee has a different name. I mean, with the tables were overflowing with materials and um, the people on the committee really combed through them. So, um, and they're quite impressive. Uh, so I noticed that you have the online part. I do. Connected. As you're looking through these, um, the site that I have right now has the units integrated, but they would specifically put them domain specific for us. So a sixth grade teacher would only have the units that they would need. Um, each grade level has nine units. It starts with a launch unit, which has only about, um, I think, 10 lessons. Then it has six core units. Oh, the launch has 11 lessons. Then the six core units have 19 lessons each. And something that is actually very nice, two of those six units have an engineering internship where they take all the information that they learned from that unit and they have the opportunity to actively engage in developing something. Mm -hmm. um, I think in that metabolism one, if I remember correctly, they have to create um, an energy bar that will meet certain requirements. Um,
Okay, so as people are browsing, and, and, and thank you for a very thorough and informative presentation, thank that you. was great. I like the way that um, when we do this, we see how a, a typical classroom works and how these resources support the standards within the framework we're looking for, for the instruction to be delivered. So thank you for tying that all together. Oh, good. Um, all right, are there any questions or comments from people on the committee? Uh, Mrs. Timmons. Yes, how long did this pilot take place over a period? I know Sue, I'm sorry, Ms. Porter <laughs> has been doing this quite a while. So over a course of how many weeks did you um, pilot this program? Just this specific program yes. here. Uh -huh. It was probably about four weeks before time started running out and we had to review all the resources. Okay, thank you. Um, Mrs. Oakman. Thank you. How many teachers were on the pilot? Well, we had two teachers that were on the pilot. They volunteered, and I couldn't have asked for two better teachers. They are both our district, and they're actually state facilitators for that NGSX program, so they have the background knowledge. And on top of that, they had piloted the other two resources that we were reviewing, so they were able to compare mm -hmm. both of them. On top of that, I made sure that this um, trial account was available to all the middle school teachers, so they could look at it if they wanted to. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, um, anyone else? Did you have something, Mr. Kaufman? Go ahead. Thank you, it's sort of related to Mrs. Oden's question. Um, you mentioned that there were five days of professional development, so, I'm, and you needed additional time, right? You said there was professional development already delivered and that you needed additional, uh, I wrote five days or necessary, my note here to myself, five days, was it given or is what is needed? So are you saying the five days that Amplify is offering or are you talking about the five-day professional development that we had given our middle school teachers prior to our pilot? I'm interested in the prior to the pilot. So prior and was that for all the middle school teachers? All the middle school teachers that weren't retiring that year. Okay. And what is your remaining need for professional development? Will the Amplify offer satisfy what you need, or will there be more over that? Well, we have different programs going on. They're offering the five-day program again this summer. Um, we're hoping to get some elementary school teachers, possibly some high school teachers in there as well. We also have middle school teachers that either they were new to the district or um, in sixth grade, they moved from one discipline to another. So they would also need that training. So we are offering that. And then the five days, I mean, it's hard to say at this point if after those five days we would need more. I don't think we should use the five days in the first year. We would have this resource for seven years. I think it would be much more prudent to have an introductory professional development with Amplify, either have a check-in mid-year and maybe an end of year, but make sure that we hold on to a couple of those days so as we get new people into the district or people get more used to the program that we can go deeper. Another question. So I'm curious about the materials. They're structured as a workbook. So is mm -hmm. it intended for the students to write in these books? I'm glad that you said that. Um, all three resources were structured the same. There was an online portion, there was a print teacher book, and then there were the student workbooks. And a majority of the teachers, what they found was if they used the workbooks, then when they brought things up on the screen, because what's online can be updated, what they had in front of them was out of date. So there might be actually different questions that the students were doing, and then the teacher would bring up something totally new. So many of the teachers 
they didn't like the idea of having the workbook. They liked the idea of being able to print what they wanted to use and what they thought their students needed from the site itself because then it wouldn't be out of date for one thing. Um, the other thing was some teachers felt that the workbook made it more like a program. You know, it was more difficult to add something that they thought would help the students in there. Um, it was more difficult if they wanted to skip something. So a majority of the teachers would prefer to print what's offline. And what I can show you here, um, when you click on a unit, they have all of this, and you can actually read it while it's online, but you can also download it. And I've downloaded a number of these and just put them on a flash drive so I can have them. It gives you all the print materials you need. Um, it gives you any of the readings that you need. And this really doesn't add to the printing at all. Um, because our old resource, they gave us a CD-ROM. I think we had the workbooks for one year and not every teacher used them. Uh, and once the CD-ROM got to a certain age, we couldn't use them in our computers anymore. So people had saved them as PDFs, luckily, elsewhere, so that they could still print them off. But from our old resource, we had always printed off anything that we wanted the students to be able to do. Another reason that we sort of shied away from purchasing those, I'll show you a little something. So those are the workbooks that I've had teachers collect that the students didn't use. That was just one school. I have three pictures of the boxes. Else, I mean, look at that. So people know it was not a pre, pre, I didn't know about the pictures of all the books, so it was uh, not so, set up or anything. Right, like well, I, I put them there just, just in case. Um, but the idea is, if you purchase all those workbooks, the number of workbooks that will go unused will be a big waste. Yep. So, so I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. I'm concerned about print costs at the mm -hmm. district. We print over, I don't even know what the number is, but well over 26 million copies a year for a school district. Mm -hmm. And I know the math uh, program, they generate the materials they want to use and then we send it out to another vendor and that's $100,000 a year just for math, customized math books that the teachers want for their classes. So I'm curious, are, are we looking similarly in the science area, kind of what they're already doing in the math area where you have this huge library of materials and as you spoke, you're going to be downloading them and printing them mm -hmm. per generally on demand, I'll just say it that way, to the teacher's specific need, um, I'm concerned about printing costs over the long term. I'm glad to hear we're not buying books we're not going to use, mm -hmm. but they come out of different budgets, right? So, and that leads me to a, another question about money. I'm just cu curious, is this currently in next year's budget, or is it replaceable? an existing line item for materials be used to purchase this program? And I'm just curious, do you have the money to do what you want? So that's really my next Are you question. still talking about printing or are you talking about the resource It's gonna be totally? both. Well, like I had mentioned before, what the teachers are doing now, well not now because they've been piloting, but prior to the pilot, They've been printing for the last 15 years all the things that they need. So you're saying those costs are just in our copying costs currently? I believe most of them probably are. Okay, Dr. McKinney. Just to correct some of the things that were stated, the, the Eureka materials are used uh, in a pre-printed fashion, only K through six, and sent out to a printer for uh, around $68,000 
those teachers do also print and copy the assessments in the building, uh, such as homework, the exit tickets, the mid and end of unit modules. There are funds in next year's curriculum budget for uh, utilizing Amplify Science. There would be a need for additional funds after that for the uh, following budget year. Um, but the consultation that I've had with our chief operating officer continues to be that it's cheaper for us to print those things in district by teachers than to outsource them or have large quantities of boxes and materials that are not being utilized. One last question. What is the cost of the Amplify license? You said it was for a long-term period of time. An estimate? Um, it's a seven-year license and it includes a number of items and they have sent a figure but it hasn't been totally negotiated so I don't feel like I should be giving that figure at this time. Is it a district-wide number? Is it per student? Is, I'm just curious. Uh, is it per head? How many students are using the program or is it a site license for the entire district? Dr. McKinney. Uh, Madam Chair, we're here to um, approve and make a motion for the recommendation of these materials to move forward to the board. Just like with the elementary literacy pilot, when they come to the board level, we'll have the financial details there. There's about $40,000 in the curriculum budget for next year to start this program and do the professional development for teachers. Uh, the ongoing longer costs would be something that would be discussed most likely at the board level in finance and ops. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. So at this point, I would like to make a motion to adopt Amplify Science as the science resource in grades six through eight. I second that. Okay. And we'll take a, a vote. Um, I vote enthusiastically yes. Can um, we have a question? Pardon me? Uh, can I have a question? I, okay. Go ahead. Um, I'm just puzzled, and I, I don't mean to break up your vote. But if we're doing a seven-year license, we're committing the district seven years to, towards it. And we have the budget, as Mr. McKin Dr. McKinney said, for one year, the $40,000. I, I presume we'll figure out how to do the rest of it, but we are locking the digit district in for seven years. So I, I just don't think that the finances are non-germane when we're making an approval for a seven-year commitment to something that we don't really know what the numbers are. And I know that they're not ready. It's still in negotiation. I'm just sort of puzzled as I won't be voting for this without the details. So we're going to vote for to recommend this as the resource. And as Dr. McKinney said, we'll have that financial discussion at the full board member, at the but, full board meeting. Okay. The question I'm having is we're recommending to the full board usually we recommend with the money you don't so our recommendation goes to them and they vote on the same thing so you're saying it's going to go to the full board and then it's going to be an expanded motion that's puzzling and, and not conventional either could you speak to that dr mckinney so before what had happened if you recall back there was a middle school program study sync that was approved by the board it came to through curriculum evaluation and then they had a five-year uh, cost that was included and that money was put into the curriculum budget for five years at $250,000. So a similar thing will be coming. I spoke to Dan Donovan, the chief operating officer of the National School District, and he advised doing the same because the increases in monies would have to be appropriated for next year. So when you're talking about a seven-year commitment, this is not one of those years. This is $40,000 already in the curriculum budget to obtain additional materials above and beyond what's already been piloted in the hands of teachers as a beginning to what's coming next. Thank you. All right, so we'll continue the vote. Yeah. All right, Mrs. Timmons? Yes. And Ms. Hohensi? No. Okay, thank you. So uh, the motion passes two to nothing, and that will go to the full board. And thank you for all of your hard work in doing this, and all the teachers and students and families who participated in this pilot. I know it's really exciting, and when I saw the materials, I wanted to be back in middle school. <laughs> so thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I, so, thank you. I had one final question. Just for clarification, it's probably my fault. I probably missed something. 
But when I asked, you said there were two pilot teachers, mm -hmm. and then you continued to talk about the teachers want this or that. Were all teachers using this this year? No. 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 How we, many teachers were using it? Two had two. the opportunity to use it. Those two that have um, the background training, and they had already piloted the other two resources. Okay. So what they did is they stopped piloting what they had piloted to pilot this resource. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Thank you very much. Thank you. I enjoyed that. Mr. Kaufman. Just as a point of order, the vote was two in favor and one opposed. Two in favor, said. one opposed. So I, I have, I have yep, that. She's got it in the notes. I understand, but the chair of the committee did not repeat that. She said two in favor. She didn't report the full vote, which is what we're supposed to do. Okay, next. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, our next presentation. We're excited to have more guests here. Um, we have a presentation on play-based learning. Um, we have two principals here with us, Sherry Fulton and Trish Ballou, and uh, we're gonna do a little bit of a swap here. <laughs> we also have two kindergarten teachers, excuse me, I'm sorry. We have enough chairs over there? Yes. Okay. Okay, so Dr. McKinney, please. Uh, so I just want to introduce um, Principal Fulton and Pr Principal Ballou from Charlotte Ave and Dr. Chris, respectively. They have helped with um, a couple of things. First, um, bringing the kindergarten screening tool to the district and working with our kindergarten teachers. That was our first year last year, as well as bringing some um, knowledge and practice to play-based learning in kindergarten, uh, which was uh, passed by law this August. So I'd like to turn things over to them and thank them for all their hard work. Thank you. So what we began with was just looking at, there were a couple different workshops that were offered by the state and then UNH to kind of bring everyone up to the same speed and making sure that everyone understood what the law meant. So the first slide is really just the law. Um, and what the big thing from the law really talks about is it really is talking about four key components, exploration, movement, expression, and play. And anyone who's been in a kindergarten classroom knows that that's, they're so engaged and so excited to learn all the time. Uh -huh. So it really is really what we need to do. It also does talk about the physical, social, cognitive, and language base. Um, so when we're looking, we're really kind of getting them set up to understand how to learn. I think too, in all that um, the different workshops that we have attended, it's really what really good teaching yeah. for our little ones. Um, you know, we are kindergarten is where you learn to love learning and you love to be in school, and um, this is about that. And it's giving them time to explore and to learn about each other at the same time. In the workshops, they talk about how play is authentic um, to learning. Students really, when they're exploring and figuring things out, they really do kind of make those connections and understand what, um, what the teacher is trying to teach. Um, it's engaging, they enjoy themselves. It's so important that we make sure that what we do, and great teachers, I mean, when you walk in and out, they are engaging, they are excited, they are bringing in um, hands-on activities because they're five, and with five, they really do need that excitement. Yes. 
and you'll hear more in uh, as we talk about this, but a quarter of their day should be in movement. Um, so all that we do um, to get them up and moving and not sitting for uh, long periods of time uh, really increases their learning and um, keeps them engaged in what we're doing. And as you know, if you've been in kindergarten, they can't sit. <laughs> they just, I mean, they have to, every like seven to 10 minutes, we do need to transition. Mm -hmm. So it's important. Um, you know, we also look at um, comprehensive view of development, looking at their cognitive skills, looking at social awareness skills, emotional expression. That self-regulation, in the beginning of the year to now, we see such a difference. Um, because in the beginning of the year, even sitting on a carpet, is challenging. Um, they're rolling. They don't really really realize where their bodies are and where the others are. So they're constantly touching and moving. Now when you walk in, you see that they really are understanding expectations. They know where they are. They know how to sit and not touch. Um, it's so important. That physical development, being yeah. aware. The presenter, one of the presenters that we saw who will be coming in for um, preschool and they invited the kindergarten teachers in. It's um, Ter Terry um, Bowen Irish. She was saying, this is the generation of the bucket babies. Mm -hmm. They're in their carriers so much mm -hmm. that they really, it, it takes them a long time to understand where they end because they're always being couched in those little buckets. If you watch in the supermarket, they take them out of the car, they put them in the car, mm -hmm. car seat. You know, they're just moving them in those buckets. Um, and they said, honestly, these children, for a lot of us, we had to take our kids out of the car seat <laughs> and we had them on our hips and we walked and they kind of balanced and learned where they were. This generation really doesn't have that. And when you go to preschool and you go to kindergarten, you see it. Yes. It's amazing how physical they are, mm -hmm. but they really, once they ground with someone, they're fine, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I think that's one of the most um, intriguing things that we've learned in all of this. And I look at a lot of our students and wonder if they were truly bucket babies because they do have that trouble um, and work with OTs in trying to just keep their, their core stiff and, and be able to stand up and not fall on the floor and roll around. It, that to me was one of the most fascinating things we learned through this process. With play-based learning, I think there's a misunderstanding at times that we're just going to let them play. Mm -hmm. And play by itself really isn't leading to learning. Um, but learning really has to be a big part of that play-based learning. So there's always a focus. There's always a purpose. And they're going to use a variety of different strategies to teach it. I was fortunate to go to the workshop with um, the two teachers that have joined us here tonight, um, Heather and Jess. And on the way up, our big question was, how do we integrate all those mandated standards? Mm -hmm. Like, it's great to have kids play. They have to play. They have to move. They have to explore. But the standards are the standards. And in order for them to be ready for first grade, we have to expose them and have them practice. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very exciting to see different ideas of how to teach standards in a more play-based activity. Um, and we did ask, I asked Jess to bring some of the ones because she came back and created them right away. I was, I was very excited. <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to bring some of them? Do you want to see a couple now or do you want me to keep going? Because the activities really are, when you look and go, it's so simple, mm -hmm. but the kids love them. Um, let's plow through and then we okay. can pull them up. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, it really is about developing that confidence and the curiosity too, and that love of learning. So the more they explore and they make connections themselves, the more engaged they are and the more they are proud of themselves and they know they can do it. You know, with kindergartners, they even start shutting down when they realize they're not getting it. So it's so important that we give them different ways of showing that they can do things. 
With play-based learning, you're looking at the child-directed free play, you're looking at the mutually-directed guided play, and then the teacher-directed guided play. They're all different ways of getting them to the practice different skills, and it's important that we see all of it in our kindergartens. Mm -hmm. Um, like, that's really fun. Um, <laughs> when you look at that and you say, they probably, you could probably have heard a pin drop because they couldn't wait to figure out what they were going to get to do. Um, and then you look and say, teaching a concept, this hooks them. And it's probably something when they're 25, they're going to say, remember the day the teacher brought the chickens to class? Or we saw them hatch. We used to always do that. We used to do things like that all the time in education. Um, and then we got to a point where we're like, how to fit it in. It's so important because these are real life experiences that they will make great connections with and be able to share. I bet you all of those kindergartners could have write, written a really good story mm -hmm. after this lesson because it was real, it was right there in front of them. It's a great picture. <laughs> You know, it, it, one of the things we think about with the cognitive domain, it's really teaching them how to focus and think about things. And when you look at math and spatial reasoning and problem solving, each one of them are so important. And good lessons really cross all the domains. I'm not going to read each one because I know you guys have it in your hand too. I think the physical domain, though, is the one that we really need to be focused on more purposefully. I think with the cognitive and everything else, we, we really write our plans, we know what we're doing. We need to be mindful about how much are they moving, how can we incorporate movement as we're teaching other skills. Um, you can see how proud they are of just building this structure. And again, real life, hands-on, they probably had a problem they had to figure out and they incorporated all those cups. And you better believe they knocked them over probably right after. <laughs> Our next steps are ongoing professional development in those conversations with our kindergarten teachers so that we're all on the same page of what it looks like. And if some activity works well in one school, we want to share it and make sure it's being used in all the schools. Um, you know, we're looking at a summer institute. Last summer, we were fortunate to sit with our kindergarten teachers um, and work with them to kind of develop the screener and talk about what's important as we're placing. They crave that time together because in a lot of schools, there's two or three. It's not a big um, population to compare notes and see what works and what doesn't. And after that, a lot of them have continued on meeting monthly after school to talk about what's going on, what problems are coming up, how they handle different things. They, it kind of really connected them and they are looking forward to this summer institute. This is the research that's out there with play, um, the benefits to um, memory, language, improving planning skills, attitudes about school. They say there's a positive relationship between IQ scores and social dramatic play. Um, play happens. It relieves stressors. Plus, they, they're engaged, they're confident, they're excited about learning. Another book that we're looking at is called Purposeful Play. Mm -hmm. um, it's a book that we're hoping to get for all of our kindergarten teachers for our summer institute um, because it's another book that um, hits, highlights all of these beneficial things as well as giving them some um, really helpful tips of how to use this in their classroom. And the last slide is that point that a quarter of the learning time should be physical. Um, it really is the developmental level that they're at they need to move. Um, kindergartners are having more difficulty with students forming connections and being engaged than they were 10 years ago. So it re the more focused we are and the more activities that are engaging, fun, and they move a lot, the better the chances. What we find too is if you do a physical activity right after, 
they're primed to learn. Mm -hmm. They're very focused, they're very engaged, sitting at their desk. If, if we, we don't have desks in our building, um, we have tables, but they're ready to really engage and in, in do the activity. So they do need to move so that they're ready to really show what they learned. I would like just to share some of the activities, I mean, that she has created from the presenter because honestly, the whole way up we were asking questions, the whole way back we're like, oh, that was so easy, we could do that. That was, that was really good, yeah, I'm gonna do that. And as soon as Jess got back, she started creating them and, and sharing them, and so did Heather. Mm -hmm. um. Well, to speak to that, on the ride up and on the ride back, because we carpooled up, we were able to collaborate a little bit, which is mm -hmm. what we crave, you're absolutely right, in talking about well, what small aspects of the day could we make more physical, could we make some of those physical goals that we want to um, accomplish easier for us or more accessible for the children. And Jess mentioned that her team had gotten rid of paper and pencil morning work when they got in and they were doing fine motor bins. And I was like, can you text me pictures of that? Show me what you did, what resource did you use? And the next day she did, she texted it to me and I was super excited about that because I'm like, yes, there's an idea that her team had that I would love to bring to my team because that's not something that's curriculum based, that's not part of one of our set curricula that we use, but it's something that helps and is gonna help everything else. And so sharing ideas like that is amazing. And the presenter, Terry Bowen Irish, she comes from an occupational therapy background, which is why she was talking about the physical differences we see in students now than we did 10 or 15 years ago. And one of the things that she said was, it's very difficult to expect a child to write a diagonal line and think about how many letters have a slide to them if they can't cross the midline. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to expect a five-year-old to track reading, and we do have an expectation of end-of-year goals at reading at a level D, that's multiple lines on a page, if they can't track a ball rolling towards them and be able to catch it, so, or roll it back to someone. So those, it's all connected. And so that really struck me. I do a lot of cross-body movements in my class, those breaks in between transitions. And again, that was not original to me, that was from colleagues, that we share ideas and what works best for us. Mm -hmm. Hi, so a lot of the ideas that we took from the workshop Oh, I'm sorry, I have a soft voice. Okay. Um, a lot of the ideas that we took from the workshop really were very cost effective. Some of it is just paper um, and just really to get our kids moving and to be engaged. Um, so a lot of these things are things that I do in my morning drawer. So when they come in the first 15 minutes of school, they engage in like fine motor activities. So these are from some of the drawers that they um, use. So. Some things are just really easy. So this was just a piece of paper that we laminated. And this is something that we would do for the whole class. Everyone would have one of these. They have a clear bingo chip. And we work on our sight words. We spell out our sight words and they, they turn it and they get to each letter. And then when they're done, if the word is eat, they say like E, A, T, eat. Oh. Um, so just kind of fun things like that, that, I mean, our end of the year expectation is that they know 95 sight words just flashing them at them every day is not an engaging way for them to learn them. Um, so another idea we had, and you know, all teachers love the dollar store. <laughs> we, can't, we can't get enough of it. Um, so we just made this little um, sort of game board that has all different sight words, and the kids play together. They put this on, they shoot it back and forth, and it really works on fine motor, motor planning, um, and then once they find a sight word, they say what it is. Then again, from the dollar store, um, <laughs> they write it out on here. And what's great too is they're also really working on their social skills too. They're working on um, taking turns. They're working on regulating themselves when they can't land this on one of the words. Um, so it's a lot of different skills and just other fun things. So. One of our um, standards is about applying phonics to decoding. So we have, in one of their drawers, they'd have a bunch of these little pieces of paper. It's very exciting, it's like a treasure in each one of these. <laughs> and they would open it up and they would sound it out. And then they would decide if it was a real word 
or a nonsense word. So is it treasure or is it trash? We throw away the nonsense oh, words. Okay. Yeah. And then they love, you know, anything with whiteboards, um, markers, anything like that. So then this matches. So it says real words and it says nonsense words. So they would sound this out very multisensory. They tap it out, we'll og, and then decide if it's a real word or a nonsense word. And then when they're done, they crumple it up <laughs> and they throw it in the trash can. Um, so it's just like some fun sort of hands-on things. Um, nothing that's really costs a lot of money, um, but just getting involved. And another thing, you know, just for movement, also when we're doing sight words, maybe we're basketballing them. If the word is eat, they go E A T, eat. And, you know, and they're up and moving around, and it's really fun. Or we're windshield wipering them, you know, and working on some of those things. It's just about engaging them, because they all love any of these activities. Um, what's hard to do? Let's just give them a piece of paper and a pencil. and put, I mean, it's not where they're at. So we have to meet them where they're at. We have to engage them because we do ask a lot of kindergartners. And um, it's amazing how much they rise to the challenge, too. They do a great job. Okay, hey, Mrs. Timmons. Thank you. Um, I'm having two new kindergartners going into school next year. I have one now. And one is going to Dr. Chris and the other one is going to the Ledge Street. And one is at Birch Hill right now. He absolutely loves kindergarten. Um, he, he plays, he's happy, he cries when he don't, <laughs> can't go to school on Saturday and Sunday. And he, I noticed the difference from the beginning of the year until now because I pick him up. And um, the kids was all over the place. They were crying from their mom. And then now they line up on the, on the um, walkway, their little backpacks there, and they wait patiently till the car pull up and, and the parent um, picked them up. And they, I see the transform, um, transformation from that point to now. So you guys do a wonderful job. I can't wait to see what my Maya do um, next year in kindergarten. And I'm sure she's going to be happy. She's a happy kid. And so, therefore, I'm sure she'll be happy over there at Dr. Chris. And thank you for all your work. Oh, I just want you. to point that out. Whatever you're doing, keep doing, because it's you. working. I appreciate that. Um, Ms. Hohensi. Thank you. I'm delighted that you came, and I'm hearing more about this um, play-based learning. I have been waiting a long time. I have a few questions, though. Um, this uh, summer institute is that here at our school, so the people that were trained last year are giving it for the people that haven't had the training. I actually thought it was on. I'm sorry. Um, it's it's a time when all the kindergarten teachers come together. Mm -hmm. Last year we designed the screener that we use now to um, try to decide, you know, what skills they come to us with. So we designed that. Um, with help of reading specialists and whatnot, a time when they could share ideas. Um, this year, we're hoping to bring Terry in so she can do some um, discussion of some of the things we learned that um, that the teachers can do from an OT perspective, but also go back, revisit our um, screener to make sure we've got it exactly the way we want it to be. Um, so it's kind of a, um, a time when our kindergarten teachers can come together, get paid, talk together. And it was held at Trisha's school last year, and I'm hoping it'll be at Dr. Crisp this year. Follow-up question? I just want to know what, what the screener is. Is that so you can figure out their levels or where they'd be best placed to make sure that the school can handle is that yes. the type? Okay. Yeah. And what we've done too is we um, we know is our, our kindergartners have to have a dyslexia screening as well. So we've mixed it together so that it's all really good information. Um, it's actually a lot of fun. They go from center to center, interacting with a different teacher, and then everybody puts their thoughts together on um, you know this particular child and where they'd be best placed with um, you know which teacher. So that it's it's over a course of of three days that we do this, and it's it's really been very exciting. Last year, we're excited to do it again this year. Sounds In the nice. past, just to give you an idea, we've really they're they're unknown. They come to us. We have done a, a mini screener before, but a lot of kids register in August, mm -hmm. and then we the unknowns get kind of shifted between the rooms, 
and sometimes all of your very busy physical kids end up in one room. And then you go to the next room and you're like, oh, she's gonna have a good year? And we need to keep these down. So it kind of, not only just academics, we're looking at how are they presenting? Mm -hmm. Are they able to sit in their seat? Are they able to listen for directions? And so we try and balance all the rooms. And this year there was a remarkable difference. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Another question? I just want to know if the kindergarten has iPads or computers or is it mostly hands-on and play? It that, varies from school to it school. It does, yeah. We do have like a couple iPads in the room that are used sometimes at center time. They're not used even daily, I would say. No, really just, am I on? Um, when we do daily five, maybe one of the centers might be practicing you know, different skills on the iPad, but really it's very minimal what we're doing with, with iPads. Most of it is just very hands-on. Okay, thank you, and I appreciate it. We have appreciate. iPads at our school, in our, in, I have them in my class, and again, it's a center option, so the children are on it 10 to 15 minutes a day, and then they move on to another center, and on it, it is educational approved mm -hmm. apps mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that have been approved by the district. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Ogden. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I'm sure all teachers were excited, kindergarten teachers were excited to see this play-based kindergarten come back. Mm -hmm. right. So uh, we, you didn't have much time. I see Liz, a uh, technical advisory was issued August 13th. There was training on August 20th and August 24th, and a lot of teachers are out for the summer. So I'm wondering, I'm gonna ask administration, did kindergarten teachers have much of a chance to meet amongst themselves at grade level over early release days? Um, so there was a training on the November in-service day, and there was another one on the February day. Um, but I think the presentations that have come um, I would say we're trying to find the right match. So the ones that were provided by the Department of Education are kind of very uh, right. academic. Mm -hmm. um, this presentation seems to be the one that teachers are asking for practical strategies they can take away and put in the classroom. So uh, if we can engage this uh, presenter and have her there at the Kindergarten Institute in August, I think that's gonna be a uh, win-win. I have to say as a former first grade teacher, and I, I bet, Ms. Porter found the same thing. Some of the, the best professional development on early release days was having a chance to sit down with colleagues from other buildings to get different ideas. And I would encourage the district to make use of that because you talked about coming back from a, a presentation in a car and the sharing. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, I found that some of the most valuable uh, early release day workshops that I went to. So I would hope we, we could move forward with, with that. Also, I had one question. When teachers, and, and I should have asked the teacher at um, Lisa Janicek, when teachers go and spend the day during the summer for PD, do they get paid for it? For the institute? Yes, they do. How about if they, they like the math teachers went, do they get paid uh, PD for that when they go in the summer for a workshop? Uh, it certainly depends on the activity. When we publish the summer PD calendar, some are paid and some are voluntary. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Uh, thrilled to see what you guys are doing. I've been subbing up in Merrimack. I've had fifth and sixth grade, so I can appreciate the movement piece, and I'll say even the fifth grade. I had them come back from lunch just last week, and I said, okay, I've never done this before. Just shake it off, shake it off, whatever that was, and they were dancing in the aisles, and so I can appreciate even the older kids, So, which leads me, I have three questions. Um, let me just start with the movement. Do you see a need to integrate movement in the other 
you know, K, you know, grade one, two, or other grades? Is that something you think will spill over from your experience with kindergarten into the other grades? And mm -hmm. can you? Is, does, the, does the time allow you to do that? With first grade, they have to move as well. They're six. <laughs> um, so what you see is um, good teaching, good strategies have always incorporated this movement. Um, you'll go in and, you know, you say, shake it off. They, they do um, mindfulness. They do, they'll do some yoga poses sometimes. They get ready and they go right back to work. Or they'll do a, um, a little video where they're all following the direction. And again, it gets them settled and they're more engaged. Um, you can see as they start to glaze over when they need that movement break. So in first, in second, in third. Um, one of my second grade teachers right now does a Zen moment when they come back from lunch. And at that time, they just take a moment to center because they come back a little disheveled. And she said, when I started doing it, I didn't think it would be a big deal, but really they're so much more engaged. And Jess also came back and did the same. Yeah, I do the same after lunch, as you said, it's you know they're very they're up here when they come back so the first thing we do is we just do a mindful mo a minute and we do we might just do starfish breathing in and out up and down our fingers but i give them the words to match it you know right now we're going to calm our body calm our mind we're getting ready to learn and it's amazing they come right down they i say you know you can shut your eyes you don't have to shut your eyes whatever you feel comfortable doing almost all of them shut their eyes and then we take a few deep breaths and then we're ready to move on to the next thing. It's a really nice transition for them. I'll say to you that learning, we discussed this before briefly, learning about your body and what your body mm -hmm. is doing and where your body is, is actually a learned skill. We don't just know what that is. And so I do something very similar. And the words I use many times are just, what does it feel like right now? What does your body feel like? Put your hand on your heart and your hand on your tummy and we do a few deep breaths and say, okay, what does your body feel like now? Does your body feel ready to learn? Has your breath slowed down? Has your heart slowed down? Okay, let's go. Yeah, we do it all the way to fifth grade in our building, yep. Right. I have two quick questions. Uh, well, two questions anyway. First uh, quick one is, is it currently, so it's implemented in all kindergarten programs throughout the district? This is a district-wide initiative, or is it just in your schools? Are you referencing play-based learning? Yes, the presentation you gave us. All kindergartners are being exposed to play-based learning. Great, and then my next question kind of alludes to what you said about the 95 sight words as a challenge for the end of the year. So that leads me to this question. Are the expectations, I'm gonna say it a different way, are the academic expectations a little too, are they too high for kindergarten? The standards are challenging, but that's the way they've been adopted by the state uh, frameworks and from the Common Core standards. So our curriculum and learning expectations are aligned to that. Are they more rigorous? Yes, but as you heard from the teachers, the kids and the parents can rise to that challenge and by integrating more play-based learning opportunities, um, we're very confident our kids can succeed. Are you finishing the program, the curriculum by the end of the year? Or do you have stuff that you can't get to? Have we exposed them to every, we've exposed them to everything. Okay, thank you very um, much, this range, is great stuff. There's a range of who masters and. Oh, that's a different yeah. story. Yeah, yep. I understand. Um, thank so you, Hensley. that was wonderful. Thank you. I just have a question about um, half day kindergarten. I don't think there's many students, but what is the protocol for a student that comes either in the morning or the afternoon Does uh, to make sure that student doesn't get behind? How, how does that work out? in terms of the standards and all that they've got to accomplish academically. You don't want them to come each day and feel like they're a half a step behind the other kids. So what accommodation is made? So the guideline that's been put in place is that the principal meets with the teacher and the parent to um, coordinate the best half-day program that works for them, whether it's the morning, the afternoon, in the middle of the day. Um, that's been the directive that's been working out pretty, pretty well so far. But how does, what coverage do they get of all the academics that are expected of them? Do they, 
do they get behind or they can keep up doing a half day with the kids that are doing a full day? Is there any tricks of the trade that you, that you use to, to make it all work? I, I don't think it would be, um, um, the gift of time does make a difference. So we have seen by full day kindergarten more kids uh, coming even better prepared going into first grade, but we do the best we can with the half day kindergarten option. And I'm sure teachers who have taught either half day can say having additional time has made a huge difference. Um, so we do our best to cover all the academic standards and offer support uh, throughout the school day and at home, um, but it is limited by the half day option. Well, yeah, I understand that. But what I'm, I guess what I'm suggesting is say you do math in the morning or English in the afternoon so that they would get, they would get a continuum of one or the other so they wouldn't be behind. Is something like that set up or is everything intermingled or? Again, it's based on the meeting with the parent and the teacher. It's a half day option. We're not obligated to make a full half day program, but from the teachers and the principals I've spoken to, the parents are content with the half day option and how it works out in their schedule. It's similar to a home uh, schooled student who comes and participates during courses of the day, because mm -hmm. of the other half of the day, they may be participating in other activities, enrichment, tutoring, academic support. So it really depends. We don't limit them to saying you have to come in the morning or the afternoon. So, so um, you bring up an issue. Are homeschoolers that allowed to do a half day or a part of the day in um, classes that would be below high school? So I know in high school, you sign up for a particular class, it's very simple. But is what is the protocol for somebody that's at home that says they wanna come in for a specific subject? Are they allowed to come in just at that time slot? Are, are we offering this to them if they, if they want it? There are homeschooled students in a number of our schools. I'm sure the principals could speak to that, but we have kids who come in just for socialization that come for a lunch recess and uh, UAs, art, music, PE, library. We have other kids okay. who come um, for a portion of the day but may leave for math because they're in an accelerated math experience. So okay. they're welcome to uh, join us. We're, we're open 180 some days a year. Well, thank you. I wasn't familiar with the process at the lower end of mm -hmm. the spectrum, so that was helpful. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank all of you for coming. You have these kids brand new to school, most of them, and you make it a real pleasure for them. I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm missing going back to first grade. Kindergarten, bless you. I think, <laughs> I think it's tough and just listening to you uh, I can see the dedication, and I really appreciate it, and our kids are lucky to have teachers like you, and I know you speak for all of the kindergarten teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Well said, Mrs. Oden. She always does such a nice job. We are just thrilled to hear about this. Um, this is the place, you know, where we just want to hear the successes of the programs, of the students, um, to affirm the hard work that teachers do every day, all year long, not just during school. Um, and uh, I, those games are just amazing, and I recognize those things from the dollar store. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I had those trash cans. So thank you very much for all that you do. And uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to come here at 7 o'clock on a school night, and you've been here since 5.30. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, so we have just two things left. This is a, a full packed agenda, all of good stuff. Okay, so um, there have been some requests from both parents and board members um, regarding uh, recess in elementary school. So um, Dr. McKinney has uh, prepared a couple of things so we can just all kind of get on the same page about recess in elementary school. So we'll give him a minute to get settled. So we had a uh, principal's meeting last week and we've had some you know, new staff and some um, new principals. So we just reviewed the guidelines that have been in place for a number of years that all students will have a uh, recess period of no less than 20 minutes before or after lunch. 
that all students will have a 15 minute snack during the course of the day. Kids in students in grades K to three shall routinely have a second recess of 15 minutes, sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon. And then students in grades four and five may occasionally have a second recess period, uh, certainly depending on the grade level team and the teachers. Um, and that second recess may not necessarily always mean going out uh, to the playground, but it could mean walking around the school or playing games. Um, there are a number of apps and things on the web that they're using to um, get some mo motor movement for kids. Um, so those are the current guidelines and the principals are in agreement with all those. So um, I think this is a good opportunity just to revisit practice and reinforce kind of the expectations around the guidelines. All right, do we have any questions or comments about uh, recess? Okay, Mrs. Oden. Um, I was teaching when this went into effect and uh, the original uh, recommendation, I believe, went down to first grade uh, and I came and spoke against it uh, because I see recess as a learning time for children to learn how to share be considerate, include others. It's very social, and it can be an important learning uh, time for them. I think you have to look at schedules. I, don't, I know the two of you have been in meetings with teachers, and after two hours, it's really hard to concentrate and to keep their attention. I can look at the elementary school I taught at, and our fifth graders went to lunch at 10 minutes of 11, and they were back in class by 11.30, 20 minutes for lunch and 20 minutes for recess. That means a little over three hours for the afternoon. Uh, I think that's far too much. I think that's far too long without a break, maybe some fresh air. Other schools probably have different schedules, I'm guessing, and I would hope that we would give the school and the teachers more latitude whether their kids need it or not. I can tell you there were some days, even in first grade, if my kids were all on task and it was one of those days, we didn't go out and they'd say to me at lunchtime, we didn't have recess. Well, I'd say we were all so busy working that we just forgot about it. So. I would hope we would give leeway to schools and to teachers that should, should your, your schedule work out where you have a three hour block, I, I think they need a break. That's, that's my professional opinion. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think these are um, guidelines. These are uh, the basement, not the ceiling. There's time before more um, recess and breaks for kids. And this also gave me a reason I collect all the schedules, both uh, for all the schools, and I went through a number of them to make sure they're in there. But um, I can see both sides of it. I see teachers who um, have a lot to cover over the course of the year, and I feel the pinch of time. But then I also see teachers in schools who say, look, my teachers take my kids out, and they're routinely 10 minutes to the dot because the kids need it. Teachers probably need it too, so they just go out, take a break, and then they come back. So this is just to keep some degree of consistency throughout the schools, um, but certainly I think there are more, and as you heard from the teachers today, looking for creative ways to give kids uh, opportunities to get m movement, self-regulation, social skills, the whole child. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Hohensi? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. I'm well, I understand that we should give leeway to the t teachers and, and the principals, and I don't want the board to dictate. Um, I was thinking more in line of encouraging, because I think at the same time, we have to listen to the voices of parents. If you've got one neighborhood where the parents feel that there's more recess needed, especially for boys, um, then, you know, maybe that school, I hope, would listen to them and, and be more flexible to listen to parents. Um, I'm wondering, do what percentage of them use the optional recess from fourth to fifth grade? Is it known or is it unknown? Is that, because it looks like it's, it's pretty consistent. You've got the 20 minutes of lunchtime recess, you got a snack, 15 minutes, and you've got 15 minute recess in third to fourth 
a K to third grade. But you're saying in fourth to fifth grade, that 15 minute second recess is optional. So I guess that's the only contention point that parents have come to us. So what percentage of our, our schools are using that second recess or is that unknown to anyone? So just so I'm clear, you're asking about the fourth and fifth grade occasionally having the mm -hmm. second recess period. Mm -hmm. how, how frequently is that? 25% of the time? And more so than that, um, I didn't bring the chart with me. When I look through the schedules, I do see it on the schedule. Mm -hmm. So of course, we all know the best laid plans doesn't always happen. So my plan after reviewing and auditing the schedules that I had in front of me was to reach out to the schools and follow up with some kind of questions and comments for the administration of those schools to put into place. So if they're there, um, use them. If they're not in there, tell me when you're having those um, uh, recess periods so I know about them. Okay. So the fourth and fifth graders, as far as you know, based on the schedules you've collected, they have the individual option or is it the administration tells them when they, I, I'm just trying to understand the dynamics. Um, I, I want to say it's the teacher option. I, I could be wrong, but I see it in their master schedules that I see it's listed okay. for those times. So what do we tell parents that are concerned? Should they speak with their teachers? And hopefully the teacher will say, okay, well, there's yep. enough parents in, in my fourth grade class. Maybe I should try to do this more often. Is that the yep. approach you would give a parent? Certainly contacting the teacher if they don't find relief there, the assistant principal, the principal, then they're welcome to contact my office or the director of student services. Okay, um, the usual. But okay. I would hope that, you know, if they're hearing numerous um, concerns about that, that the building administration is addressing, addressing those things. Because mm -hmm. I certainly hear about them when um, there are conflicts or aggressive behavior that happens at recess, I definitely hear about those as well. Right. And the recess helps unwind the kids so we don't have so much, hopefully, aggressive behavior. There was an issue on recess before lunch a couple of years back, and we did a policy. We encouraged the best practice of recess before lunch. Do you have any idea um, where that stands in the district? It, again, it's optional. Um, Ballpark, I would say it's kind of half and half. It's, okay. it's, it seems to be manageable for the smaller schools to do it, and they do it pretty consistently. The larger schools, particularly with the addition of kindergarten with an additional uh, lunch period, right. has taken away a lot of the flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that's probably... The reason. Uh, uh, yeah, about half the schools do RBL. Okay, thank you. All right, um, as a former fifth grade teacher, I taught second grade and we went out to recess fifth grade. And you know, I think that teachers are pretty in tune with their students and um, pretty responsive to what they need. And when your class needs recess, you know it and <laughs> you can't change it. And you know, and, there, and it can look different ways. It can be going outside. It can be doing something in the class. You know, sometimes they just want a downtime. You know, they could, you know, and depending on what your schedule is, I know that we always had um, first specialist and last lunch, which really helped. So it, it also depends on what the schedule is that you're given and to have the flexibility to be responsive to your students, what they need and what your schedule is. Mm -hmm. Plus, you, you know, you've got to um, take into mind all the, the, uh, the support staff that's coming into your class and, you know, so... Um, I, I think teachers do a, a great job at knowing what they need and our principals know what our kids need and I, I hope that parents feel comfortable coming in and expressing, um, you know, because sometimes kids say something at home that you don't know at school, so that's important. So thank you, thank you. All right, are we good? All right, okay, and the last agenda item, thank you, Dr. McKinney, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you again before you leave, that was great, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have our curriculum chronicle for K-5 and 6-8, which was included in your packet. Do you mm -hmm. want to speak to that at all? It's pretty self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. These are just our monthly curriculum uh, newsletters that we try to send out, um, mostly K-5, but now we're um, expanding to uh, K-12, so. I, yeah, I did notice that. And there's, there's a lot of good information in there. It's nice to, um, and these are, um, teachers can see these and, yeah, yeah. And who writes these? Uh, the curriculum team, K-12, uh, the curriculum specialists, the middle school coaches, and the head teachers. Um, 
from either the high school or the, the, the uh, departments. Excellent. Do we have any questions or comments on the curriculum chronicles? I think they're great. I love it when they come in the packet. I enjoy okay. reading them. Thank you. <laughs> All right, good. All set. All right, so I make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in, well, we're, okay, we all know that we want to adjourn. Ms. Hohensi, would you like to adjourn? Oh, yes. Okay, I would like to adjourn. Ms. Loden, yes. would you like to? All right, so we're in agreement. So we are adjourned at 7-11.